Hello, welcome to 8.9 News. I'm Finn Locustain. The new DEFRA secretary, Steve Barclay, comes into the role at a time of fundamental change. With the ending of the basic payment scheme for farmers, the acceleration of environmental crisis, a health and obesity emergency, and the rise of natural capital markets. And in the government as a whole, DEFRA's star is rising because its portfolio issues are becoming ever more important. Patrick Holden is the executive director of the Sustainable Food Trust. I asked him, as a farmer and land manager, looking to the future in the context of food production and ecological security, how important is DEFRA on the ground? For any farmer, um, if you look back to the pre-Brexit days, the receipt in the form of a single farm payment of 90 plus pounds an acre per year represents probably a sizable proportion of our net income. So uh, I think it re will remain true that the government is a major influence on farming practice and economics, and no farmer can completely afford to ignore the um, framework of support which government sets. So the short answer to your question is very important indeed, although that isn't to say that I approve of what's going on at the moment. Well, tell me about that and tell me about how uh, you've been working with DEFRA over the last few years from the Sustainable Food Trust. How have you found uh, engagement with DEFRA? Well, in a word, really, really disappointing to the point where I think that the Elms um, package uh, is likely to either freeze agriculture in the present um, extractive uh, position that it's been really for many years um, or actually even worse exacerbate it so I think that um, DEFRA have got completely the wrong end of the stick and maybe it's summarized uh, by the way in which they understand the need to support agriculture and uh, if you look at the Elms package um, it's really taken the uh, the area payment and divided it into three uh, one bit supports stewardship, another bit supports landscape scale change, and a third element, uh, sustainable farming practice. And of course, if you divide by nine, 90 or 100 by three, you get not very much, 30 pounds an acre or so. And that's really all that's left to support a systemic change towards more genuinely sustainable farming across the board. And I think the reason why DEFRA have got it wrong is because they've concentrated on stewardship and habitat, not remembering that actually the whole farm is a habitat and you cannot produce healthy food unless you regard the farm as an ecosystem. And instead of doing that, I think that DEFRA have accepted that um, the farming system as it is, is likely to remain roughly the same. And therefore they've spent a lot of the money, maybe even up to two thirds of the money, focusing on the bits around the edge of the field um, and the habitats which need to be, as in their view, protected, rather than understanding that we need to bring about a systemic change in farming practice right across the board and organising and framing the future support that farmers need to get with that mindset. And that hasn't been present in DEFRA. It hasn't been present with Therese Coffey, and who knows, but I doubt if it'll be present uh, with the new Secretary of State, because after all, I mean, this sounds disparaging, but it's not meant to be. Um, ministers really move from post to post, rather like cornflakes, buyers to white goods in a supermarket. You know, I mean, they don't have any expertise when they come to the office. So really, that means that the focus of attention has to be on the civil servants. I mean, maybe the minister, the new minister will have a particular interest, perhaps in health. But if he doesn't understand what I've just tried to explain, rather long-windedly about the need to really uh, engineer a, a fundamental shift in farming practice, then we're just going to be tinkering around. Going back six years, when we were first having these conversations and Michael Gove was Secretary of State, there seemed to be a higher level of uh, ambition. Uh, and there was almost a sense that these systemic issues were going to get addressed. Where do you think it went wrong? What are the key things? What, what were the key influences that stopped that from taking place, do you think? Well, I do agree with you. I think that Michael Gove, uh, although I disagree with him about the unfrozen moment, as he coined it, he said, oh, we were in the tyranny of the grip of EU 
agricultural policy and now we've got the chance to do our own thing. Well, he was right there, but of course uh, he didn't acknowledge that one of the reasons why uh, the common agricultural policy wasn't greened at a more rapid rate was because successive British governments had held the change back. So that was rather ironic. But he did he did correctly identify an opportunity. But unfortunately, uh, since he left office, and actually, it, it, I have to admit, even before that, uh, his hapless officials, most of whom know little about agriculture, but sort of swallowed the Kool-Aid, that it was all about protecting what was left of biodiversity rather than, or, uh, than engineering a systemic change, have just tinkered around. And here we are, whatever it is, seven years later now, eight years later, with a right old mess. And it is true to say that some farmers who are already farming sustainably and organically can make the best of a bad lot by um, getting paid for some of the practices that they'd already introduced. But for big intensive farmers, they look at the Elms package and they think, well, I'll do a bit of pick and mix. Um, there isn't enough for me to make a systemic change. So I'll carry on what I was doing before, harvesting what I can of the stewardship bits in the menu and uh, remain confused about what the government really wants in terms of the future direction of British agriculture. Patrick, one of the big decisions, I think, influenced by NGOs was the decision to remove acreage payments for farmers. Do you think that that was the right thing to do? No, I always thought it was completely the wrong decision, because if you're going to encourage a change of practice across a farm, you have to reward farmers on an area basis. So it was right to decouple payments from what was effectively just a social security payment if you didn't if you didn't break the law, you got the money. But what it should have been done was recoupled still on an area basis. So let's say, you know, I farm 300 odd acres in Wales. Um, I could still be paid on a per acre or per hectare basis for adopting or maintaining, in my case, farming practices which deliver on climate, nature and people. And uh, if the new incentive package was linked to the area under my management, but only available to me if I either adopt or, as, as I said, continue to use practices which don't cause harm, which reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which increase biodiversity, not around the edges of the fields, but in the middle of the field, and deliver educational benefits and health benefits, then I think that would be the right signal uh, to move the dial right across the country, which is what we need. Now, you talked about the civil service a little while ago. And when we're thinking about the reasons that that farming revolution didn't happen, where do you place the blame? I don't want to be rude about the um, officials in DEFRA. I'm sure they're doing their best, but very few of them know anything about agriculture. And I've always thought for many years that if you design agricultural policy well, an intimate knowledge of agricultural practice, you're almost certain to get it wrong. And I would say that the people who are the leaders in terms of shaping the policy in DEFRA do not come from agricultural backgrounds. How could you possibly expect them to know what would be right? And then to add insult to injury, and this is a bit critical, I have to say, the NGOs, I think, have tacitly gone along with the assumption that you can't really change productive agriculture using, you know, chemical inputs and all that kind of thing on the majority of the land area. So they focused their attention on stewardship, greening the bits around the edges, wildflower strips, that kind of thing, which is actually completely the wrong approach. The whole farm is a habitat. And I am old enough to remember back in the 1950s when I was a child, that you could go onto a farm in the Eastern counties and find that the farming system could coexist with an extraordinary profusion of biodiversity. That's all been lost because through no fault of the farmers, they've introduced chemical inputs to grow two blades of grass or ears of wheat where one grew before. And as a result, the field habitat has become completely hostile to all forms of life other than the crop they were growing. That's what's got to change. The field is the habitat. The farm is an ecosystem. That is the mindset we need if we're going to reframe agricultural policy support. And we can do that. We can do it now. It's not too late. How did you feel when you heard the news of Therese Coffey's resignation? I don't think it makes any difference, to be absolutely honest. I think what matters is that we have this new awareness of how we frame new agricultural policy. And probably 
those that will survive what looks as if it's going to be a change of government are more important than the Secretary of State. So we happen to have a, it's very rare you get a politician who leads. Mostly they just want to get elected and they listen to the officials who say, yes, Minister, yes, Secretary of State, whatever it is. And because there's such a mess of thinking in the DEFRA team at the moment. I doubt very much whether the new Secretary of State will have the time to make any difference whatsoever in the short, likely short period that he is in office. And I don't hold anything against them. You know, how could he know? I mean, he comes from health. That's interesting. So maybe, just maybe, he will realise that the consequence of intensive agricultural practice is damage to public health. And that creates a financial case for investing more, not less, uh, in the OMS package. Well, let's just talk a bit more about health there. Um, The nutritional content of the food that's being produced, uh, about the way in which there is an obesity crisis, a crisis across health, and the way that uh, we manage land, the way that we produce food, not only can have an impact on resilience uh, in terms of ecological security, but but on reducing the uh, amount of money that we have to spend within the health service. Now, Steve Barclay, the new Secretary of State, has come from the Department of Health. Do you think that presents an opportunity, even in the short term, uh, to try and change some government priorities? Well, I'll tell you a story. It's sort of a blast from the past story. We've got uh, David now, Lord Cameron, coming into government. Uh, I had a meeting with Gordon Brown, ex-Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor. Just at the beginning of the Labour administration, I met him at the House of Commons and I said to him, What would you think about the idea that if we invested in more sustainable agriculture, we could save money on NHS treatment costs? And he looked at me and thought for a moment. He said, that sounds very new labour. And then, of course, nothing happened. But in truth, we are risking bankrupting our government with ever escalating NHS treatment costs. And it's very interesting that people now are starting to realise this. Um, Chris Van Tullican. Uh, has pointed out that ultra-processed food is causing enormous public health damage. But what he didn't point out, but I think he probably would agree with me, uh, is that actually processing and the ultra-processing of food is merely adding insult to the injury of the commodity crops which have been produced using intensive methods which are less nutrient-dense and probably have residues in them which are harmful to public health, which wasn't the case 50 years ago. So we want to The the patient agriculture is sick. And if we restore the patient agriculture to health, the consequences will be reduced NHS treatment costs. Now, if Steve Barclay could realise that, this would be something. Patrick, if you could summarise your chief priorities for the new Secretary of State, what would they be? Realise that agriculture sits right at the heart of public and environmental health. The planet today is no longer you know, a a nature reserve. It's a farm, a global farm. And so if we want to restore the public, public health, the health of nature, we have to make fundamental changes in our farming systems. And the best way to understand that would be to come and visit some farms which are practicing good ecological agriculture and are producing healthy yields of healthy food. Because really, in the end, good agricultural policy should be inspired by practice and practitioners probably hold the key to the reforms which are necessary in ELMS and in the other policy packages of the devolved nations. That was Patrick Holden from the Sustainable Food Trust. More news on our website, 8.9.com. That's all for now. We're back soon. Thanks for watching.